take your Bible and open to 1 Samuel chapter number 14. 1 Samuel 14. Now, we've been talking about this spring series about what it means to be a, a pleaser of God. Um, Kale, actually, I have a battery that works in my mic this week, so you may want to pull me down just a little bit. I don't want to get too loud. I don't want to blow you all away. When your hair starts pushing back, I know I'm too loud. So, um, If I have a choice rather than to put a smile on God's face or to put a frown on God's face, I choose a smile. Now, I know that God loves me, period. I know that he loves everything uh, that is me. He may not like everything that I do, but he loves me. But I, the Bible tells us that we have a, an opportunity to put a smile on his face. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please God without faith. But he who comes to God, uh, but he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want to please God. I want to live a life of faith. Now, that does not mean faith on Brian's terms. That means being open to live faith on God's terms. That means not just that which is easy, but that which is good and right and expedient. I want to have a life that is the shape of God, not the shape of me. I understand it comes to the flavor of me, but I want to live a life that can, that can have God expectations and God's will. Now, sometimes when we try to define faith, we, we use Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And, and that's 100% true, but when you're living out faith, sometimes that's as clear as mud. Because truly, faith is acting on the Word of God, the heart of God, the whisper of the Holy Spirit. The problem is, is we don't always know, we, we know what this is. And let the yes be yes and let the no be no. But there are times that we're, we're not too sure and, and, it, and we're left to almost guess what the right thing is. And, and there's indecision. Can you, can you, I know this is what God's word says, but, and we're not sure. There's indecision in our life. And indecision can paralyze you. It's, it's haunting so many people. But let me just ask you, I, I, Laura, our secretary, she, she kind of wants me to put a, a sermon title with my sermon so she can put it in a bulletin. And I struggle with that. But I got thinking about it and I said, Laura, what does abstract mean? And she told me her definition and somebody else was in the office and I said, what does abstract mean? I went, Mark, were you in there when we do this? He was in there. Well, then all of a sudden Laura looked it up and this is the definition that it, it says of abstract. Existing in thought or an idea, you've got the thought, you've got the idea, but not having a physical or concrete existence. So I'm talking today about abstract faith. What happens when you've got the thought or the idea, but it's not there yet? It's not through cooking. What is it if God speaks to you, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to act upon it? Or are you just going to let it go? I think in my life, the things I regret oftentimes are the things when I know it's the will of God, yet I have indecision or I'm not too sure if I want to do it or not. So here's the point. If we know it's God, are we going to do it? Are we going to put a smile on his face? And it's not always easy. Maybe we're saying, Lord, I've got indecision. Do I do this or not? What happens if God may be leading you to not wait on heaven? What if God is waiting for you to make the first move? And maybe the faith that he's looking is for you to act on the, the, the impulse rather than waiting to see the scripture written on the sky. In my life, are y'all ready for this? I've never been less certain than I've, in, in all my life but I've also never been more confident. Now that may not make much sense to you. And, and there are some things in my life that I'm truly certain of. I, I know that God called me to be your pastor. I said no to seven, seven times to churches before I came here. 
but I am extremely confident that God is up to something. And I am extremely confident that I want to be a part of whatever God is up to. And I don't want to be, I don't want my lack of faith to get in the way, so I'm, I'm open to the voice of God. I want to have my ears open to whatever it is that he might want to do. If he says yes, the answer is yes. That's it. If he says no, then, then I want to say no, and I want to say it confidently. And if I'm not sure, then I need to act on my faith. In 1 Samuel 13, don't turn there, but in 1 Samuel 13, Saul had become the new king of Israel. And the Philistines were out there, and there were some skirmishes going on. And, and he decided that he needed to get an army together. So he gathered, it tells us in, in, in verse 2, he gathered an army of 3,000 men. 3,000 in. men. The problem was is that the Philistines had an army too, and they were coming against Israel, and they had 30,000 chariots. That's tanks. Ten tanks for every Israeli soldier. They had 6,000 horsemen. Their cavalry, they had two horsemen for every Israeli soldier. But what about soldiers? It tells us like the sands of the seashore. Can you say outnumbered? Can you say scared? As a matter of fact, it got to the place that, place that of the 3,000 soldiers that Saul had, 2,400 of them ran. Look what it says in verse 6 of chapter 13. Uh, the men of Israel saw that they were in danger, for the people were in were distress. I guess so. Then the people hid in caves and thickets and rocks and holes and in pits. 2,400 of them just left. Find a cave or a pit or a hole or behind a rock or in a thicket. Now, hold on. This is not Uncle Remus here. Who would go hide in the thicket? I'd find someplace better, amen? But they're probably thinking, There's, this may be uncomfortable, but at least I'll be safe here. Not the good place for a soldier to be. And here we see Saul, Samuel the prophet, told him to wait. But he was impatient and unbelief. And he uh, went ahead of Saul and out of an act of unbelief, he, he did the... It was, Samuel said he'd show up within seven days. Seven days came, seven days left. Saul said he's not here. He said, bring me a burnt offering. And Saul made the burnt offering. And Samuel said, you messed up. He did funny. Soon as Saul got through, through with giving the burnt offering, Samuel walks up. Isn't it funny how, come on, we can be on the verge of something amazing, but a lack of faith will keep the miracle away. God forbid. If we go through all that we go through in life to get to the point where we can be pleasing to God, where God can use us, even us, may we never get to that point and back out on unbelief and impatience, and wanting it our way. Samuel tells Saul, I would have, God would have made you a blessing for a thousand generations, but because of this, no more. God's seeking for someone after his own heart. By the way, he found that person, didn't he? David. That's another sermon for another day. And it tells us in verse 23 of chapter 13, the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Mishmash. Now get this, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, soldiers like the sand of the sea, and they come to this place, this strategic place, a cliff here and a cliff here. They've got the, they've got the high ground. If you've ever watched an old western, y'all know what I'm talking about? Somebody would look at it and say, this is a good place for an ambush. Well, amen. And the Philistines were in the power position. Or at least it seemed like they did. Look in chapter 14, verse 1. I, I love this wonderful scripture. It says, Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor. So here's Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he says to him, Come. Let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. Just the two of us. Hey, guy, come on, let's go. 
Let's go. Let's, let's go to them. Hold on. 2,400 of them are hiding in holes, caves, behind rocks, and in thickets. And Jonathan looks over to his friend and says, hey, come on, let's go. I wonder how big the eyes of the armor bearer got. Do you think he gave a holy do? Faith will do that to you. But look what he says here. But he did not tell his father. He didn't tell his father. All right, church, listen to me just for a moment. If God puts an impulse on your heart, if God is leading you to do something and you know the voice of God, be very careful who you talk to about it. I'm not telling you not to tell someone, but you better tell the right one. Because if you tell the right one, they will amen your faith. But if you tell the wrong one, they'll throw cold water on it. If you go to the wrong one, they'll look at you and say, are you an idiot? Are you stupid? Don't you know better? They'll start saying those things. And let, here, can I just be honest? If you're walking up here with God and, and God's speaking to you, you need to say, thank you, Lord. Because you have an ear that's open to the voice of God. And if God's speaking to you and you go up to somebody else whose faith is down here, do not expect them to just jump up here with you. They're going to try to bring you down to their level. Because that makes them comfortable. But faith begets faith. So Jonathan looks over his armor bearer and says, come on, let's go over there to the Philistines. Look what his armor bearer says. Amen, let's do it. Where were the leaders? Verse 2, Saul sitting under a pomegranate tree. Verse 3, the priest who should have the ear of God, Ahijah, who has the ephod. That's a sermon for a different day, but it's what the... It's what the priest would wear. It had the jewels on the outside. It was kind of like one of a, a lady's apron that they would put on. But on the inside of it, close to the heart, were two rocks that, that the, the, the priest would look at to find the will of God, to hear the voice of God. One would shine for yes, and the other one would be dull for no, or, or vice versa. So you could hear a voice from God. But what were they doing? Not a thing. There seems to be a, a plethora of people who are willing to not do very much. But Jonathan says, come on, let's go. Look what it says in verse 4. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side, a sharp rock on the other side, and the name of one was Bozes. By the way, that means slippery, and the name of the other, Sana, which means thorny. So he says, there they are, there's these two cliffs, the Philistines on the top, one of them slippery, one of them thorny, and he, he says to his armor bearer, come on, let's go. The, one, uh, the front of one faced northward, opposite Mishmash, the other faced southward, towards Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Y'all listening? Y'all listening? Jonathan says, come, let us go over to the garrison of these Philistines, these uncircumcised. He's talking smack. He's getting a little bold now. There's something that's rising up within him, and he's saying, these are uncircumcised. We're the children of God. Come, let us go over. Then he says this. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Maybe. Perhaps. Possibly that the Lord will work for us. Then he makes a, this next statement's great. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. That last phrase sounds like a faith phrase, doesn't it? He's saying, Nothing restrains the Lord. Nothing can hold him back. He can save whether there are many of us or just a couple of us. 
But as far as I'm concerned, that's not the big words. He looks over to his armor bearer and says, let's go to these uncircumcised. Maybe the Lord will do something. It may be, possibly, that the Lord will work for us. I'm not sure, but I'm going to believe anyway. That's abstract faith. It's not yet permanent. It's just an idea. It's just a thought. But I believe God in heaven, looking down on Jonathan and hearing this, and he has the, gra- he has the belief, nothing restrains God, but he says, maybe, possibly, it could be that God would do something. I wonder how many of us are waiting for God to permanently write it out and make it absolutely clean and clear before we ever move. Well, it's good for the preacher, and I think the preacher, if he wants to do that, let him go do that. By the way, I need to. Y'all good with that? But that doesn't excuse anybody else. You want to be a God pleaser? If you want to be a God pleaser, you're going to have to walk by faith. And whatever your definition of faith is, it's acting on the Word of God. But I wonder if you're willing to act on the possibility when you're not too sure and it may fail. Are you still willing? It's kind of quiet in here. I mean, you need to think about it. Are you willing to step out when you're not sure maybe you'll be just the absolute greatest blunder in the world for the glory of God I mean we love reading Hebrews 11 and praise God for Abraham and praise God for Noah praise God for for, for all these great people of faith who, who conquered and did all these wonderful things but what about me well what about you how big is your God Can God use even you? Are you open to the possibility? When somebody has an idea, are you going to amen it or are you going to shoot it down? If God's seeking to do something big and strong, are you going to be there to to say, yes, Lord, yes? Or are you going to try to say, well, I don't know. Let's just do this, this. Maybe we can just do this little thing first. Maybe we'll, maybe. God help us, let's go or let's not. What about some people who will say, I'm not sure, but I know God can, and I'm willing to be used. I told you when we started this series, I was going to start telling you about some things you may have never heard before. Listen, this is a tough place. He's between slippery and thorny, and he's not too sure. I believe it could be one of the evidences that you're headed in the right way if it's difficult. Come, it may be. Listen to the armor bearer, verse 7. Do all that is in your heart. (laughs) Wow. Wouldn't you love to have a friend like that? You go to him and say, God's been putting this on my heart, and, and I think this is what God's wanting me to do. And they said, yes, do it. Man, that'll fire you up right there. God help us, we don't need any more of the cold water committee to put out any fire of God that he might be blessing. But oh, if we can find some people that have some embers, some embers there that just need the Holy Spirit to blow on them and get them hot again. I'm fine and good with talking about in the past of all the things that God has done and how he has blessed in a great and mighty way. And for the saints before, thank God for the saints before who did great and mighty acts and works. We can't live on yesterday. God's wanting to do a work in this community today. There are families that need to be restored today. There are people who need to be saved. There are, need, there are soul winners that need to, to get on fire for God and say, I, I might fail at this, but I'm going to try anyway. Out of love. Do all that is in your heart. I believe God's sitting up now and he's watching. 
I think God in heaven is excited. Listen to the armor bearer. Do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you according to your heart. By the way, let me throw in a verse. People like promises. Y'all like promises? Let me read this to you out of my notes. This is 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. That means God's looking on us. What's he looking for? To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. God's looking for somebody that he can show himself strong. It's just a matter of, are we going to be a part of that? Go then. I'm with you. Verse 8, Jonathan said, very well. All right then. Amen. Thank you, brother. Then he says, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. What? Where's the stealth in that? Let's go out there and go, hey, guys. They're up there on the strong. I got to quit hitting my side here. They're up there on the stronghold, and we're just going to go up and say, here I am. That's one of the stupidest ideas I've ever heard in all my life. Isn't it to you? You're not even going to sneak up behind them. You're just going to hit them. Here I am. That's about as stupid as Moses going to the Red Sea and putting his staff out and expecting God just to part the Red Sea and the children of Israel could drive through or go through on dry land. Amen? That's about as stupid as David fighting Goliath with a sword with a rock. That's pretty stupid. That's about as stupid as Jesus taking a boy's lunch, feeding 5,000 people with it. That was pretty dumb. That's about as stupid as Mary going to Joseph and saying, I'm pregnant, but I haven't been with anybody. Dad's, God's the father. That's pretty stupid. That's about as stupid as Peter being in a boat and getting out of a perfectly good boat, even though there's a storm going on, to walk on water. You don't come to think about it. A lot of things that happen in the Bible where God shows up mightily is when somebody's doing something pretty stupid. Are y'all good with that? Maybe he's looking for the small thing so he can show himself big. Let's show ourselves to him. Let's just go up there. Well, then he says in verse 9, If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. Verse 10, but if they say thus, uh, come up to us and we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into the hands and this will be a sign to us. Y'all look at me. He's making this stuff up. He is making this up. We're going to go out there and we'll show ourselves to them. If they say, hey, y'all be still, we'll come down to you, then we'll be still. But if they say, come up to us then we'll know that, and, and I love it, in verse 10 it says, for the Lord has delivered them. That's past tense. How can you have past tense when it hadn't even happened? Because he's already seen the victory. Tell me the voices that you hear here. You hear the voice of Jonathan? You hear the voice of the armor bearer? And we're about to hear the voice of the Philistines. Y'all good with that? Where's God's voice in that? The only voice of God that we have here is to the heart of Jonathan. And yet, he says, let's do it. Now, you can have all the great ideas in the world, and it means nothing. Have y'all ever had a good idea? Oh, come on. Have y'all ever watched those shows late at night and they have those commercials? And you get a, a Ginzu knife and for $19.99, and if you call the next 15 minutes, we'll give you two of them. And, and it'll cut your potatoes and it'll wash your car. And it'll, it'll, it'll sew up your pants for you. 
And you can even get a cloth to go with it that'll take the rustiest car in the world and make it shine like it's brand new. And you look at that and you say, well, I could have done that. Uber. Have any of y'all ever heard of Uber? Some of y'all have. It just had an IPO, an initial public offering. They went public in their stock. They got billionaires now. Billionaires because they came up with an idea. But, but don't tell me you had that idea first because it doesn't matter. They're the ones who had the idea and acted on it. Y'all good with that? I wonder how many great ideas we've had, Mark. We just hadn't done anything with them. I wonder how many ideas that we've had that, that we share with somebody and somebody talked us out of it. I wonder how many times God came and said, this is what I'm, I'm wanting you to do. And we said, well, maybe I, I'm just not too sure. If, if I can ever get sure about it, maybe then I'll do it. At this point in time, all we've had is an idea. But now it's about to come real. Verse 11. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the hose where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and, and said, Come up to us and we will show you something. I call this glory dust. Because they've been thinking about it, and now they're acting on it. And now all of a sudden the things that they thought might the things that they thought might happen are starting to come. They're starting to open up. And I believe when he heard those words of those Philistines, the bumps started to come up and down him. Come up after us. Well, verse 13, and Jonathan climbed on his hands and knees with his armor bearers after him. Listen, I'm about to close. If you're waiting for it to be easy, you're not, you might as well stop. Because what he did was he climbed up on his hands and knees. That tells me before there's victory, there's vulnerability. Thirty thousand chariots, six thousand horsemen, soldiers, and they're crawling up on their hands and knees, either up thorny or slippery, I don't know which side. But they're crawling up, and it's almost like the Philistines are going, watch these idiots come up here. And just watch them as they come up. Absolutely laid bare and vulnerable. Let me just ask this. Are you willing to be vulnerable? Right now, you've got to ask that question in your heart. If God speaks, you need to say, bless you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord. What an honor it is for you to speak. What an honor. But are you willing to act upon it? What if they laugh at you? What if you fail? The only thing I know is this. If you don't do something, you'll do nothing. Faith is doing something. Faith is hearing and bravely acting. Will you be vulnerable? Yes. Yes. Will it be comfortable? No. Will God work? It may be. Possibly. Perhaps. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees and his armor bearer after him and he fell before Jonathan. And as he came after him, the armor bearer killed them. That first 14, that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within a, about half an acre of land. Jonathan and his armor bearer killed 20 people in a half acre. And God was with him. And God began to orchestrate beyond them. They said, let's do this. And they couldn't see all that was going to come after it. But God began to create chaos among them. And the next thing you know, Philistines were fighting with Philistines. And one was coming up against the next. And the sound of it was so great that they said the earth began to shake. 
and it woke up Saul underneath the pomegranate tree. And he looks at it and says, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And it crescendos and it gets more and more. And, and, and Saul finally says, we got to go. And they went. And even the cowards who were hiding in the caves and the pits and behind the, the thickets, now there's something that's rising up within and now 3,000 soldiers are going after like the sands of the seashore. And they're wiping them out. You see, all Jonathan saw was the beginning. But because he had faith enough to act, not only did he and his armor bearer kill 20, but the entire Philistine army. And if you were taking odds, you wouldn't have been betting on the Israelites. The entire army is defeated you see we may see a small part by faith we may have a, a small glimpse but God's got a great picture out there now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could think or ask according to the power that works in us Ephesians 3 20 but it begins by someone saying, I want to please God, and I want to say yes to that little impulse of faith. Oh, what God could do. Oh, what God could do. Maybe, perhaps, possibly, even now. We have access to as much of God as we have faith to receive. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for these stories. I thank you for the life of Jonathan. Lord, he was willing to get out there without anything other than just a belief in you and a trust and possibly you could do something amazing. Father, we have need. We have great need. And Lord, we need great faith. And we don't just need to say that we believe things. We need to be willing to act on them. And Father, I also pray that you will give us that faith that you will raise up some faith bearers in this building. And Lord, I pray also that you would raise up some armor bearers to go along with us that will amen the faith, that will encourage our hearts. Lord, that will not seek to make it understandable in human terms, but Lord, will have a divine perspective. Oh God, we need to hear from you. Lord, I pray that if there is someone in this building today, and I believe there is, and they have not come into that relationship with you yet, they probably wondered and thought and may have even prayed many times, but yet their, their life is still empty. And Jesus, they need what you can give and what you only can give. And I pray, Lord, that right now they'll come with that clarity of thought and say, I need you, Jesus. I repent of my sins, come into my life and save me and forgive me, give me what I need, make me your child. Lord, I pray that they not just think it, but they'll do it and give their heart and life to you. But Lord, I know that there's some Christians here already, but you've been dealing in their life too. and You've been speaking in that still small voice that is very clear. Father, give them the faith. Give them the strength and the courage and the boldness to step out. Lord, it may be an abstract faith, but it's still faith. Father, I give to you New Holland Baptist Church. I give to you their future as well as this day. Use us for your honor and glory. Do a God work. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.